Hi, welcome to chapter 20 of Earth Science. So let's get started. Um, some of this material is gonna be a little bit of a review uh, and some of it's gonna be new material. So uh, uh, the stuff that we've reviewed, I'll, I will cover, but just not as uh, in depth. So um, let's get started. So the first thing that we need to talk about this chapter is climate. And so when we start looking at climate, one of the kind of the classic examples uh, that we'll look at is um, is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, uh, the first person to really constantly record carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, was uh, Charles Keeling. And what he did was he set up a um, measurement, a station that was measuring at, uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in Hawaii. And when he did this, he saw that during the course of a year, the carbon dioxide increased and decreased as the seasons changed. Uh, when the uh, vegetation uh, falls to the, to the ground, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide is trapped in those leaves. And then during the, um, uh, during the spring months, the carbon dioxide uh, will uh, adjust to deal with those the, the fluctuation from uh, the, the vegetation, uh, be, uh, carbon dioxide and being taken into the atmosphere. And so uh, what was very interesting was since 1955, we now have a really good record of how much carbon dioxide uh, we're seeing changing up and down. And that, that movement up and down um, is, uh, what we're seeing here. And um, so that monthly measurement. But when we start looking at the trend line over the course of the last 60 years, we can see it's going up. And um, here's the more, a little bit more recent data all the way up uh, until uh, November of 2023. So uh, we can definitely see that weather is transient. And so I need to distinct, uh, make a distinction between weather and climate. Weather is uh, the conditions of uh, all of the material that was on the last unit test, uh, air temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, cloudiness, dew point, uh, precipitation at a given time and a given location. Uh, climate is all of those materials over a longer period of time, usually decades to millennia. Um, I think Mark Twain said it best is, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. And so um, when we start looking at this, uh, we can see that we do have some variation uh, over the course of a year. And we can, we've, we've looked at this uh, and this is what causes those Hadley cells to move up and down uh, in terms of latitude. The most direct rays of the sun uh, are hitting at different parts of the earth. Uh, we can also see that land and water heat up differently and cool off differently. Uh, again, this is material that we've covered in previous chapters. Uh, when we start looking at those Hadley cells, we also knew uh, a little bit about where we have more rain. Uh, obviously, the further inland you go, the drier the environment. Also, um, when you're right at the middle of uh, the intertropical convergence zone, you're getting water rising. And so uh, when we start looking at putting this material together, we end up with climate. Now, um, the Koppen classification system uh, is denoted as what vegetation um, is uh, growing in these environments because certain plants grow in better temperature and pressure conditions. And so when we start looking at climates, uh, the first person to really make a classification system was Alfred Wagner's father-in-law, um, Koppen. And so when we start looking at the uh, Koppen classification system, Koppen uh, gear, um, classification system, uh, we can see that it is looked based on temperature and precipitation. So rainfall and temperature conditions. And so we've got a lot of subdivisions uh, listed here. So why do we end up with um, varying amounts of temperature on the earth? And the um, short answer is because the sun is hitting the earth differently at different angles and that heat is being trapped, um, the heat that is escaping from the earth is being trapped in the atmosphere. And that's actually a really good thing. Without an atmosphere, we would have uh, areas that are receiving sunlight would be significantly hotter and areas that aren't would be very, very cold, too cold for, for humans 
uh, to, to thrive. Uh, a good example of this is uh, a sa the same relative area in, in that the moon uh, is getting uh, very similar temperatures, but it doesn't have a sustainable atmosphere. It doesn't have an atmosphere uh, to speak of. And so as a result, uh, there are areas that are, if you're receiving sunlight, it's going to be intensely uh, high, uh, high temperatures and without the, the sun, it would drop very, very cold. But because we do have an atmosphere, we've got a lot of other uh, feedback happenings. So the first thing that can happen is sunlight can get scattered. The sh uh, indicated by short wave visible light here in blue, uh, we can see those percentage of uh, sunlight, UV light, and um, a little bit of heat waves. Uh, Coming in, into the earth, coming from the sun to the earth, uh, but then only a portion of that is making its way into the earth. Uh, when the sunlight hits the earth, uh, what will happen is the short wave radiation uh, will be converted into longer wave radiation, um, uh, which is known as heat waves. Um, and those heat waves uh, or infrared wave legs are making their way to the earth, uh, making their way out of the, uh, towards space. And um, as it's on its way back into, uh, into space, uh, this heat can get trapped. And again, this is the concept behind the greenhouse gas. And if we have a stable system, the amount of sunlight coming in is going to um, equal the amount of heat being lost. And so the, the atmosphere would be very, very consistent. And so if we have a steady state uh, model, that's exactly what we're seeing uh, over the course of a, a year, uh, we would have the same climate. And so um, and that's not to say that we have the same climate over the entire earth. If you're getting direct rays of the sun, the sun is going to be hotter. But if you're at a curved part of the earth, um, as we are, the sun is never going to be directly overhead. And so as a result, it's going to be more dissipated. Now, we know that the earth is tilted at 23 and a half degrees uh, from the plane of ecliptic. And um, this week's lab is actually looking a little bit more intense at this, uh, but there are um, four days of the year that we're going to talk about. Uh, and those four days are known as either solstices or equinoxes. Now, as the name equinox in implies, all parts of the earth are receiving the same amount, the same length of day, equal nights, 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of darkness. Um, and um, when we start looking at this um, image on the solstices, um, the sunlight is going to be the most extreme. Uh, it'll be in the Northern hemisphere, uh, in July, in June, uh, we will be receiving long days, short nights, and the sun will be higher in the sky. The angle at which the sun is striking the earth is going to be the highest it can, it could potentially be. Six months later, when the sun is the lowest in the sky, we're going to have long nights, short days, and a very uh, low angle sun. And that's going to represent us having very cold uh, this is this marks the start of winter. Um, and um, as we start looking at these seasons, uh, this is why we have seasons. The greater the tilt, it would be the greater the season. If we didn't have the earth tilted at all, you'll see in your lab that you have exactly 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness, and you don't have any variation in, in seasons. Um, now, We've already talked about Hadley cells multiple times and um, walker circulation in the ocean, um, but uh, all of these are a result of those seasons. Uh, again, air switching from moving over the ocean onto land can cause us to have monsoons. Air moving over the land to the ocean is going to cause us to have dry seasons. Uh, we uh, have covered a number of times uh, when we started looking at these these the impact of these Hadley cells. Uh, this is why we have great deserts of the world uh, in chapter 14. So when we start looking at these, uh, the, the, the uh, Hadley cells, again, these are very, very important in terms of uh, overall climate. Now, if we understand that we have a climate, we should be able to predict and model this climate. And when we do, uh, we can start looking at 
a set of in, in initial conditions uh, from which we would expect to see what the climate is. Now, if the climate is changing, uh, it can either be a global warming or a global cooling. Um, and uh, we can see these uh, represented in both the at atmosphere and the sea uh, ocean waters. So um, I mentioned um, Keeling had information since the 1950s. Uh, but if we start looking at things before the 1950s, uh, we do have little bits of information that we can glean. Uh, some of these are set up in uh, or the data that we have is going to be long-term changes uh, and, and some are going to be short-term changes. And so we'll look at some of these. Uh, these are called paleoclimate indicators. Um, uh, these are like little tiny thermostats that are set in the rocks. And um, how we can actually look at these, uh, uh, we'll go through in just a second. But when we start looking at the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, we can see the Keeling curve uh, is relatively recent. Uh, if we look at uh, areas um, up to 10,000 years ago, uh, we had a relatively consistent amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere until uh, shortly after we ramped up the amount of carbon dioxide uh, that is being put into the atmosphere through burning of fossil fuels. Now, that is very recent data. If we look, uh, when we started looking at chapter 14 under glaciers, we saw a lot of variation in uh, um, climate uh, and uh, we see that that's also recorded in the rock, in the uh, carbon dioxide record. And so when we start looking at uh, times before um, the Keeling curve, we see that we did have variations. Uh, and so we'll talk about these different changes. And I just wanted to kind of point these out. Now, when we start looking at long-term changes, uh, we, have, we can look at rock records and uh, we have had uh, some ice house periods where we had areas that were using paleomagnetism or at the equator and they had glaciers on them at sea level. And so those would have been known as an ice house period. Uh, we also have areas that would have had no glaciers on the earth whatsoever. And those would have been hot house periods. And we can contrast that to short term changes, uh, which are looking at something like the Keeling curve. Uh, we can look at pollen. We know di different plants grow in different climates. And so then we, if we have fossilized climate uh, pollen or uh, fossils, uh, this can be very, very useful in trying to figure out what the climate was like. And so uh, one plant that we'll use is something like spruce. And uh, when we start looking at where we had spruce forests today, uh, we can see that that's uh, pretty much up in Canada. Uh, but if we look at 12,000 years ago during the Laurentide ice sheet, uh, during the um, last ice age, uh, we saw that spruce forests extended further down uh, into Iowa. One other piece of data that we can use to confirm uh, our, our data is looking at oxygen-16 to oxygen-18 isotopes. Now we know that oxygen is a stable isotope, so it's not breaking down, it's not radioactively decaying. And so the amount of carbon-16 and the amount of carbon-18 on the earth is consistent. But when temperatures drop, what happens is the oxygen 18 has more of a tendency to go onto the land and not go back into the ocean. So we would expect plankton in the ocean to have not as much oxygen 16 if the temperatures are colder. If uh, we start looking on the rocks on the land, we have uh, things like uh, calcite forming in uh, precipitating out of um, in our speleothems, in our, in our cave features we'd expect those to have higher oxygen 16 uh, at the same time that we had lower oxygen 16 in the ocean. And so we have bits of data that are, are confirming that. Um, we can also use uh, as the ice transforms from fern into um, glacial ice, we can look at the bubbles uh, in the, those ice cores and we can see the amount of carbon uh, oxygen in the atmosphere and the, with the ratios of the oxygen 16 to oxygen 18. Uh, additionally, we can look at growth rings. And so we know that every year a tree will grow one ring. Um, and uh, we can see that when a 
have a warm, wet year, uh, we tend to have wider growth rings. If we had cold, dry rings, uh, cold or dry rings, uh, or cold or dry climates, or the plant would be stressed, it wouldn't grow as much. So when we start looking at the bubbles in the Arctic ice sheet, uh, we have quite a bit of variation here. And we can link this directly uh, co coincides with those ice ages and interglacials. And so um, this region right here uh, from looks like about 20, uh, 15,000 years ago to about a little over 100,000 years ago was an ice age. And then we had an interglacial, ice age, interglacial, ice age, interglacial, ice age, interglacial. And so um, again, this is what we're, we're looking at on the our ice, ice record. And um, so when we start looking at the um, these ice ages and interglacials, we also see this in uh, the advancement of uh, glacial sediment uh, in a moraine and then the glacial retreat. And so when we start looking at what's causing these variations, one thing that can happen is um, we can have a change in the amount of sunlight. Now over millennia, the sun is increasing its intensity. And so uh, we actually have record of how intense the sun is um, thanks to Galileo. We'll talk more about Galileo in an upcoming chapter, but uh, Galileo was, um, one of the things he did is he used a telescope to identify sunspots. The more sunspots we have, um, that indicates the more solar input. And so since Galileo's time, a uh, couple hundred years now, we've got um, really consistent data. And so when we start looking at the um, change over the course of human history, the amount of, or, or at least since Galileo's time, the amount of solar output hasn't really changed much. Um, one other big long-term component is uh, the atmospheric composition. So uh, carbon dioxide is one of the gases uh, that we can use to uh, monitor. Uh, and maybe if we, if we had more carbon dioxide, we'd allow more sunlight to the same amount of sunlight to come in, but we wouldn't allow the, as much heat to escape. Um, and then the distribution of continents and volcanic arcs. Um, if we have more land at the North Pole and the South Pole, uh, we'd end up with larger glaciers, because remember, uh, glaciers uh, only occur on, uh, on land. Uh, ocean currents can also be impacted by the presence of land. We started looking at those ocean gyres in chapter uh, 15, and those circulations um, uh, that the ocean currents will, mo will move in these loops until they hit a landmass. Um, the larger the landmass, the more um, drier the interior of those, those continents would be. And so if we had a supercontinent, uh, the edges would get water, but in the middle of it, it would be exceptionally dry. And if that landmass was all at the North Pole or the South Pole, uh, this would create some really dramatic temperature changes. Um, if we start looking at a change in sea level, uh, this can have a huge impact on um, the amount of water evaporating. Uh, and so that, uh, since water is a greenhouse gas uh, with a very short residence time, but it is a greenhouse gas. And so if you have more water on the atmosphere, you're going to trap more heat. Um, and then volcanic activity. When we have volcanoes occurring, uh, this is going to give off carbon dioxide and uh, this can cause additional global warming. Uh, if we have lack of volcanic activity, uh, then the temperature might act like a thermostat and cool the earth off. You know, carbon dioxide emitted from a volcano, which would mean more heat escaping. Um, weathering also plays a huge role. And so if we have land masses rising up, um, then we can expose rocks and lead to additional chemical weathering. Now, chemical weathering is really good at taking in carbon dioxide. And so uh, the more uplift we have, we'd expose more rocks. The more, And if we're exposing more rocks, uh, we could potentially take in and soak up some of that carbon dioxide. So those are some long-term uh, climate ch climatic changes. But then we also have short-term climate changes. Uh, and these, uh, again, Milankovitch uh, covered in chapter 14, 
uh, is, is, uh, can have uh, a, the most profound and, and, and synchronous uh, data uh, as a result of the change in the orbit's uh, direction, uh, change in the tilt, uh, can change the amount of the uh, amount of sunlight uh, being reflected off of the Earth. Uh, and so this is known as the albedo. And, uh, uh, and so if we change the Earth's albedo, independent of Milankovitch cycles, you can also uh, uh, cause a short-term temperature change. Uh, if we had a big eruption, uh, the aerosols from the uh, immediate eruption for the, couple, uh, for, uh, for the few years after the eruption, you block out more sun because you'd be changing the albedo of the Earth. Uh, and then uh, if we had uh, abrupt changes in carbon dioxide or, or other greenhouse gases, uh, that can also uh, abruptly change the, the climate. So uh, Milankovitch, uh, as we have already mentioned, uh, the Milankovitch's cycles um, are um, listed up here. And so the precession of the Earth, again, the tilt of which the Earth is rotating uh, toward 23 and a half degrees, um, towards the North Star, um, the, uh, to the change towards uh, every 26,000 years, it does a loop uh, change uh, towards Vega. Then the tilt of the Earth uh, changes from 23 and a half degrees to 24 and 21 degrees. Um, and then the ellipsed nature of the axis of the Earth, it changes the eccentricity or how elongated our, our orbit is, whether it's very circular or more stretched out. And this is uh, measured as eccentricity. Uh, and that changes about every 11,000 years. It goes from more elongated to rounded and then more elongated. So if we combine these Milankovitch cycles, um, what we find is that these Milankovitch, the sum of the upper um, the, of Milankovitch's cycles changes the albedo of the Earth. The angle at where the, the amount of uh, sunlight coming into the Earth's surface. And so that directly coincides with those ice ages. Um, in chapter four, we looked at volcanoes. And so immediately after an eruption, we saw that we put a lot of particulates. And uh, Pentatubo is kind of an interesting volcano because it occurred near the equator. And so it kicked up this material all the way up to the stratosphere. And so it took multiple years for the particulates to work their way out of the stratosphere. And so for the next three years, we had an exceptionally cold uh, climate associated with the particulates. Now, the long-term change, uh, if we're putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, that's going to re result in additional warming, but the, the volcanic erupted, the, the particulates caused some cooling. So we see one volcano had two different impacts on the climate one being a different uh, time scale than the other. And so we have looked at a number of different ways that we've collected data to see what the climate is like. Is, is the earth actually warming or is it cooling? Um, and so uh, these are some of the images that these are looking at bit, bits of data, um, uh, looking at the distribution of organisms looking at the edge of where a glacier is. And we know that glaciers are receding. Uh, we have seen uh, sea level change. And so let's look at some of this data. And so um, looking at data of, of different parts of the earth, uh, we can see that we have had some warming. The general trend is a warming climate, um, but not everywhere. If we look right around the edge of the Arctic, we actually have some slight cooling, but the overall ge general trend is, um, is warm. Now, um, if we look at more recent data, again, this is uh, um, data from uh, the climate.gov, uh, the US uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Climate data. Uh, we actually see that even more recent data is showing us that uh, we have an a even warmer Arctic uh, and Antarctic region. And so when we start looking at sea level change, um, if we are melting ice off of in the ocean, it's not going to change sea level because the ice is less dense. And so when ice is uh, will melt, it'll take up the same volume. But ice on land will wash off into the ocean. 
And so we can see uh, sea level increasing as a result of glaciers melting off of the continents. Additionally, warmer water will take up more volume. And so when we start looking at even more recent data, um, we have seen that uh, we are in fact seeing sea level rising. Now, I do wanna point out the scale of this. Um, this is uh, looking at the 1993 to 2008 data. And um, what we're looking at in this site is the change in millimeters. So uh, this would be 10 centimeters of change. Uh, that region right there would be 10, centi um, 10 centimeters of change over the course of, um, looks like about 20, 30, or excuse me, about 40 years. 10 centimeters over 40 years isn't much until you remember that the relief of places like Florida and a lot of these coastal shelves are really uh, quite flat. Uh, we can see that glaciers have been retreating. Um, this is the Muir Glacier, a uh, quite famous one in Alaska. And we can see that the retreat uh, from 1941 to 2004 has uh, decreased about seven miles. Um, if we start looking at the total glacial uh, ice mass in uh, Antarctica and Greenland, we can see that they have in fact um, decreased. Uh, again, looking at this is the data from your textbook from 2004 to 2013. And uh, we see that this both the ice thickness has lost uh, is is decreasing as well as the end of the glacier has has been shrinking. Um, a little bit more data since that time. Um, in Antarctica, uh, the ice mass has kind of stopped shrinking a little bit the last couple of years. Now, you may say that's a really good thing, but warmer air can hold more water. So, what is, this is uh, showing at the end over here is actually a warmer environment causing us to have more snowfall and, a, and an increase in ice mass. Uh, in Greenland, that's not the case. Uh, in Greenland, we are still seeing a change in net ice uh, over the course of the last uh, uh, 15 years. Uh, now, uh, we start looking at a change in organisms. Uh, this is the image from your book showing uh, different growing seasons. And um, just a couple of days ago in November of 2023, uh, the USDA has changed its plant hardiness. Uh, and so I wanted to pull up Missouri's plant hardiness here and we can see that the number of growing days have increased uh, and the plant hardiness uh, has, moved, has moved generally to the north. Uh, we can see a change in precipitation. Uh, this is looking at a change in precipitation from 1900 to 2000. Uh, areas that are showing a decrease in uh, is in greens and blues, and an increase is in yellows and red. And this is, should be no surprise because we know warm air can hold more water. And if you're putting more water into the atmosphere, you're going to get more uh, rain coming out. And so when we start looking at what is causing this, is it man-made? Um, is this greenhouse gases uh, from other uh, sources? And uh, unfortunately, the Keeling curve uh, does coincide almost exactly with the warming variation. Uh, again, especially when you get rid of the change from uh, seasonal variation. So when we start looking at ice records, we are in fact seeing um, that the earth is in, is in fact warming uh, well above um, any of our pre-ice um, age uh, interglacial time period uh, temperatures. So um, what are some of the changes? Well, we could have natural changes, volcanoes. Uh, if we started taking and, and getting rid of a lot of plant material uh, uh, or increasing the amount of agriculture, uh, animal res respiration will uh, add carbon dioxide, but, but also um, burning fossil fuels will take carbon out of the ground and in the process of combustion uh, releasing um, carbon dioxide. Uh, if we start uh, having microbial uh, respiration uh, or get rid of uh, organic material, decaying organic matter, uh, this can release methane or C CH4. And um, these are really, really good, um, uh, really, really effective um, 
really, really effective uh, greenhouse gases. So they really don't block, they don't allow heat to get out very easily. Um, and again, leaking of, of natural gas from, uh, 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 from reservoirs can cause uh, increase in methane. Now, we can also have chemical reactions in the soil that will actually take in methane and um, they can also take in car uh, carbon dioxide in uh, the ocean and in the process of forming um, in the process of forming limestone. So um, if we uh, are start looking at the um, amount of carbon dioxide, our amount of carbon emissions, uh, and um, we can see where the, the potential excess is going uh, in, in this, in this table. And so then once we um, account for all of the different sources and sinks, all of the different ways that you can uh, adjust the climate or parameters, we can simulate this in a model. And so what we'll typically do is plot these models and work backwards and see if it matches what we uh, would expect. So if we include the amount of eruptions taking place, the amount of insulation variances from, um, from Lankovich cycles, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we can look at a model and as you would expect, some models are a little different than others. But uh, if we plot all of the models uh, backwards and then run the models forward, we see something in between the blue line and that purple line uh, indicating the low and high emissions. Uh, and so if we average it, it would be the red line in the middle. Now, um, one thing that we would expect as a hypothesis as we just saw happen, um, the amount of uh, uh, warmer temperatures uh, would probably move uh, to uh, more expanding uh, desert environments, and they move. They would also move to higher latitudes. We would expect to see longer, warmer summers. Um, we would expect uh, precipitation to increase in the northern hemisphere in the winter because we're again warmer air can hold more water, uh, and uh, also increase in higher lat uh, increase in precipitation in high latitudes. Uh, and a decrease in the southern United States. And so, in other words, uh, we call that a drought. And um, so we could also see what would happen to sea level. And so, again, we can model the minimum amount and the maximum amount. Uh, all amounts are showing that water, is, water levels will rise. Um, and we can see uh, this is in centimeters. So um, over the course, of uh, the next 50 years, we would see water levels rise anywhere between, sorry, about five to 10 centimeters to, in our extreme case, looks like about 30 centimeters. So what makes uh, predicting what the weather is going to be like um, very difficult is, um, we have factors that can influence other factors. Um, these are known as feedback. And if you stood next to a microphone, uh, brought a microphone too close to a speaker, you've experienced something called positive feedback, where a little bit of change is enhancing those changes. Does it positive? Doesn't in this case doesn't mean good. It just means enhancing. Uh, you also, uh, your body is a pretty good feedback for temperature. If you get too cold. You start shivering and burning more calories and closing your pores to stop the evaporation from taking place. You also can um, cause a, uh, if you get too hot, you start sweating and cooling your body off. And so that would be an example of a negative feedback, a feedback that doesn't change with, um, uh, th that regulates itself. And so um, one, uh, we don't really have a really good grip of what's going to happen to clouds and its impact, is it going to be a positive feedback or a negative feedback? Because clouds can block out sun, but they can also hold heat in. And so um, that is one model that is uh, ongoing in terms of research.
So um, a number of, uh, of scientists have come together to try to look at their models, look at other people's models and compare models. Um, this is uh, usually the International Panel of Climate Change or IPCC. And they're looking at data to uh, figure out what the maximum amount is, what the minimum amount is. And they recommend uh, um, a meeting uh, and, and they get together. And one of the um, most famous examples of this uh, meeting, um, not dealing with climate change, but also with chlorofluorocarbons, was the Montreal Protocol of 1980. Now, every couple of years, uh, four or five years, the uh, panel will meet or the, this group of nations will meet together and make some recommendations for atmospheric emissions. Since um, atmosphere doesn't stop at, at country borders, uh, again, this is the need for the, these international meetings. Uh, another famous one, uh, international meeting that really addressed climate was uh, in 1997, and this was the Kyoto Protocol. And again, uh, Kyoto's a city, uh, the, these group of, uh, or, uh, of nations met together and said, we should probably uh, look at changing the amount of carbon dioxide or the amount of emissions taking place because the feedbacks, uh, it, what can happen is if we have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, then this can lead to a warmer climate. And if we have a warmer climate, um, we would ex uh, expect the albedo of the earth to, to um, be lowered, we wouldn't reflect as much sunlight, and then this can cause with these a positive feedback loop. Um, uh, another famous uh, climate policy was the Paris Agreement um, in Paris in 2016, uh, where a group of nations said, let's let's cut the amount of carbon dioxide uh, being put out. And um, it was an agreement, it was not a law, uh, but um, the next one was supposed to meet in 2020 and that didn't happen. Um, so um, when we start looking at greenhouse emissions, um, there's a couple of very easy uh, answers to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide being put out. Uh, one is uh, not use as much uh, electricity since we know that here in Missouri, the vast majority of our, our energy is coming from fossil fuels. Um, developing more efficient vehicles um, uh, we could switch to alternative fuels. So things like um, switchgrass uh, or methane, uh, those fuels would uh, be emitted, but then they would be taken back up. So the residence time uh, of, of this material is, is actually, it's taking carbon from the atmosphere in the form of photosynthesis and then uh, putting it back. So that's what they mean by alternative fuels in your textbook. And then treating carbon dioxide like large sources uh, uh, and, and taking the carbon dioxide and potentially taking it out of the atmosphere and putting it into the ground. Now that's easier said than done. Uh, finding these aquifers or, or these, these traps, um, uh, we have to make sure they're really tight, uh, meaning that they're not giving off carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is a gas that's heavier than oxygen. And so if we had, um, a, a reservoir that was holding that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or into the earth, uh, and it all leaked out into one location, it could very easily uh, cause asphyxiation. Um, and so um, a lot of the decisions that need to be made uh, are outside of the, an individual personal uh, option, but also uh, some of them are. So they, we need to handle uh, this on both a national, global, and a personal level. So. Um, that ends the material for our class for this chapter. Uh, if you have any questions, be sure to let me know.